Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors, and welcome back. I'm so glad to be back with you again today as we take a look at raising private money, syndicating deals, and creating a real estate investment fund. Mike Slotnick, better known in real estate circles as Big Mike, is better known for his due diligence, but more importantly, he is known for his professional integrity and for having a keen understanding of the financial aspects of successful real estate investing. And I can vouch for that as Mike has been a previous guest on our former show. He definitely has a keen sense of real estate financing. And Mike has a depth of expert knowledge in the pandemic created investment opportunities in real estate, what's hot and what's cold and where things are trending now. And I know we're all interested in that. Mike, take us into the show and share a memorable experience that helped you to be who you are today. Thank you, Alan, very much for having me back on your show. Excited to be uh, back as a guest. And I'll give you this memorable experience. So I grew up in the Republic of Moldova, former Soviet Union. And this was a long time ago. Now, where where are the relevance? Well, Moldova is right next to the Republic of Ukraine. Ukraine is in the spotlight of the terrible war that Putin has imposed on the people of Ukraine. So at this point of time, the country is in the war. It's not clear when that whole thing is going to be over. So I have a memorable experience. As a kid, I grew up in Moldova, but I traveled the country playing chess. I was a good, really good chess player. So one of the places I visited during my uh, travels was the city of Odessa. Odessa is a city in Ukraine on the Black Sea. It's actually a wonderful city, a very warm city, wonderful place to be. So I clearly remember I had this experience. We were walking between, you know, chess competition. We were working through a market known as Privoz. That's the word. It just doesn't mean anything other than it's a big market in Odessa. We're very well known for a lot of uh, things that happen. And the experience was like this. We were working with other kids, just walking to the market. All of a sudden, I have dirty water dumped at my feet a bucket of dirty water. And I was shocked. I was literally shocked. Who just did this and why? I, I didn't do anything wrong. And then, then there was a, an older woman. Instead of apologizing, she looked at me. Basically, she dumped the water at my feet in error. She didn't mean to, but she was just trying to dump dirty water on, on the street. And, and I was a 16-year-old kid. All of a sudden, she asked me this question out of the blue called, are you married? And not only I was in shock, I was in double shock. Lady, look at this. I'm 16 year old. What, what kind of question is that? I was put into a, essentially a shock. And before I knew she was gone, like literally gone. I couldn't see where, where she went. And I continued on. What was the lesson of the whole experience? It was a very bizarre experience. Well, the lesson was expect the unexpected. You just never know what this crazy world can throw at you. Right now, Ukraine is in a terrible war and it just happens. Sometimes these things happen. And the question itself was just, again, expecting the unexpected, including some bizarre questions. And it was a very clever technique when you went to somebody to move away from whatever problem you have, ask a question or direct the attention to something completely unrelated. And that changes. It's almost like a pain point. You break your leg, or you break your foot, or you're in pain. What do you do? You basically squeeze your finger really hard to direct the pain to another part of the body so that the body doesn't feel as much in pain from that breakage. But that's kind of the lesson of that experience. Well, a good lesson, I guess, to learn in this old world, because we do never know exactly what is going to be thrown at us. There is a really famous conductor. He's conducting now, and he is from Moldova. I can't remember his name. Do you know who that is? You know what I'm talking about? Famous conductor from Moldova? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Forgive me, I was not into music. (laughs) I was in the chess. I would know a great chess player. I don't remember a great yeah, conductor. I don't know. Anyway, he's been on the international stage here for several years, but I can't remember his name. Several outstanding composers from Moldova as well through the ages there. Well, let's go into the investment opportunities that have risen from the COVID-19 crisis and tell us about those. Sure. So obviously we're living in a very dynamic 
environment. COVID was effectively a terrible thing for the world, but the outcomes of the COVID were great opportunities, investment opportunities, and obviously we also benefited substantially from a lot of the government help and support created by essentially COVID. Very short-lived crisis from the unemployment perspective. So the government went and spent the money as if COVID was 100 times bigger. So that aside, we'll talk about this. So COVID created some real basic opportunities. One of them was a lot of hotels who were distressed pre-COVID became really distressed. And the one investment opportunity we've been writing a bunch of checks in is conversion of hotels to affordable multifamily housing. That's been a great trend. The trend continues, even though we are past the worst part of the COVID, we are still in some kind of side effects and mild version or, or future versions of the virus. But the shutdowns are over and many hotels are turned to normal. But the hotels that were older, not your typical vacation properties that are doing great today, more of um, well-located for housing hotels, but they just, all the products, the owners just took it on the chin during COVID and they didn't have the capital to invest in renovations. They become great acquisition targets for repositioning into what is very well welcomed by many cities and towns, affordable workforce housing. Now, these units are granted or small. You're, you're converting a hotel room. So in an extreme case, it's a small studio. And in a good case scenario, it becomes a one bedroom. If you take extended stay hotel, it typically has one bedroom. You could turn it into a small apartment with uh, one bedroom, one living room. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of people out there who are sensitive to having their own place, but they don't want to pay a rent or a full apartment. So they have a place to crash. They have a small kitchenette. They have enough privacy rather than sharing an apartment with roommates. It works really well for students. It works really well for maybe small husband and wife without kids. It works really well for single individuals where affordability is critical. The economics of these type of projects make total sense because your hotels trade at a much higher cap rate than multifamily. So the pricing of multifamily assets per dollar of income is substantially higher. And as a result of a conversion from a hotel operation to a multifamily housing, you remove the expenses of a hotel operation, which are substantial. So if you can maintain the same level of income by renting these apartments renovated on just a monthly basis or or annual basis, you're in phenomenal shape. If you just keep the income at the same level and remove the operating expenses of a hotel and you have a cap rate, essentially lower cap rate, the economics work really well. And even if the income drops and you make less money from a multifamily versus a hotel operation, many of these projects still make great economic sense because of the cap rate compression and the reduced cost of operation multifamily versus a hotel. So the thesis is very solid. And many of these projects generate very strong returns. There's another really interesting benefit to these projects. If you look at the multifamily in general, and we love value-add multifamily. So value-add multifamily by itself is a great asset class. But when you look at what are the three techniques or, or three methodologies, how do you create new multifamily properties? Or how do you basically improve multifamily properties? You have ground up construction, right? Two, you have value add multifamily. And three, you have conversion. What's really amazing and fascinating about the conversion projects is that you get to full stabilization, basically full conversion and lease up a whole lot faster than if you do build ground up or if you do value add. So from that perspective, we love that asset class. We continue to invest in that asset class. And that's probably best strategy, in my view, in this post-COVID world, if you're looking for a niche. Mike, that's really interesting. I mean, I knew that this was going on during the pandemic. I'm a little bit surprised that these opportunities have continued really to this point in this post-pandemic world. But what you're saying is there's still quite a few opportunities there and that the reason that they are so good is because the differentiation in the cap rates primarily. And the cost savings. And the other thing I wanted to add, why this opportunity still exists, you can't go to a Miami Beach Hotel and say, I'm going to convert it to multifamily housing. That's not going to work, right? right? But what does work if you take a hotel in the middle of uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, or one of these, you know, or South Bend, Indiana, or one of these small towns, and it's an aged hotel. They just the owners feeling that they would need to invest a substantial amount of capital to bring the hotel back into good operation. So you basically have pre-COVID opportunity that wasn't just COVID created. It existed there before where the hotel either has to be renovated 
and then lots of time and effort and dollars have to be spent to bring it into full operation, or it becomes a conversion opportunity. And plenty of them exist as that conversion opportunity, as if COVID didn't exist. So COVID accelerated the trend, but it didn't necessarily create the fact that there are aged hotels that the highest and best use is no longer a hotel, but more of a multifamily housing. And there are also some markets where the demand for these hotels softened because of, just using an example, let's just say the town has gone through some kind of a reduction in the business travel for whatever reason. If you were in an oil and gas industry for some reason, right? And there was a boom and now it's slowing down. What happens to that hotel? Right? It's just basically, it has no business, a limited business, potential conversion. But if the city still has the population and they still need for affordable housing, it could be bought at a pretty good price and conversion executed relatively at a moderate cost. One of the biggest benefits of conversion versus ground up is your costs are much more incremental. You don't have to rebuild the structure. So if you buy it right, you could still get a pretty good economic deal on the conversion cost. Plus conversion costs are a lot more predictable versus a ground up, even if construction materials inflate. Mike, that's a little bit surprising to me that it's more predictable because renovations that I've done, there's always so many surprises behind those those sheetrock walls. And I'm wondering, you know, what age are these buildings that we're talking about? Building codes were so different prior to the 1980s and electrical plumbing kind of situations are very different in pre-1980 buildings. What are you running into in those conversions in conjunction with those kind of things? So you're right from the point of view that if you get into an older product, pre sort of call it pre-late 80s, you may have to do some electrical substantial rewiring. From that perspective, you're right. But that is still predictable to do. You could go in, look at the age of this stuff and just say, hey, we need to rewire. And what would it take to rewire this building? Plumbing, obviously, has a different, and I'm not an expert in these age of electric or age of plumbing, but that is something you got to look at. Was this hotel renovated previously? What you often have, I'll give you an example, and I mentioned the product in Winston-Salem. You could have an older product that has gone through renovation. I believe the one project we did that actually was a phenomenal home run type of investment was renovated in 2013. So if you have older products that have gone through some kind of recent renovation and you can go look at what was renovated, Mm -hmm. you could at that point realize that they rewired the building already and then some of the plumbing was replaced. So there's still a degree of complexity, but if you are specializing in this type of asset strategy, and we invest, when we make these investments, we invest with the operators that do this for a living. That's their focus. So remember, I'm a fund manager, not an operator. We don't go renovate these projects. So my whole exercise is to find these great operators who do this and they know how to evaluate these projects and they know how to do this conservatively as far as the time, the cost, and the effort necessary to convert. Well, that makes sense. Of course, that makes sense in any kind of real estate investment is to invest with uh, experts because there's complexity to any real estate investment. Mike, you've got so much to offer and so much financial expertise in regards to real estate. Tell our audience what you have to offer and how it is they can get in touch with you to take advantage of that. Sure. So I appreciate the soft promotion. I just just kind of mentioned that I'm a fund manager with capital allocators. And we live in the world of obviously changing economic conditions. Fed is raising interest rates. The economy is likely already in the recession or is going into recession. It's pretty obvious what's happening. I strongly believe we are in the age of stagflation. If you go look at various possible scenarios on a forward basis, inflation is not likely going to come down too fast. So whatever Fed does in the upcoming months is not going to kill the inflation by any means because it was caused for reasons different than the what Fed is doing. Fed is doing demand destruction. Inflation was caused by supply chain problems, by the massive printing press by the government of all the, the supply of money increasing. And obviously, essentially, energy is very high. When you have energy policy that doesn't support reducing the price of oil and gas, you're creating inflation. Energy isn't everything. So at the end of the day, we're not going to see inflation coming down anytime soon. On the other side, demand destruction could be fast and furious. I just came from a conference and I'll give you this and I'll go back to what we have to offer. There was a well-known speaker at the conference, Bruce Norris. He's Mr. Southern California economist. He talks about what happens in Southern California housing market. He's very focused on 
housing, single family, residential, not multifamily. But he's well regarded because he predicted 2008 crisis. And what was really fascinating, what he said that 2008 crisis, affordability took seven years to get from where it was at the peak all the way to 17% threshold, meaning that 70% of folks in Southern California could afford an average home, only 17% or less. And that number somehow creates the affordability crisis and effectively starts the downward trend in the prices because affordability is just not there. So in this cycle, we went from pretty decent affordability in Southern California, over 25% around that range, to 17% in three months. It's so crazy because the rates moved up from such a low point and so fast that the payment factor on the mortgages went up, but people's salaries don't go up in three months. It just doesn't happen. A few folks get a raise, but it's not a normal thing. So affordability got hurt very quickly and very severely in a very short amount of time. And that continues. The trend is not over. Unfortunately, the Fed has signaled they're going to continue to do what they do. So the point that I was trying to make is that the environment is very dynamic. And as an investor, you have to be very prudent and very smart about what you invest in and kind of adjust to these rapidly changing market conditions. So that's that. But as far as what we offer folks, we offer a family of funds. We are capital allocators. And when you invest in funds, you're definitely investing in the management team and the expertise of principals and the strategies that we deploy to allocate capital in this environment. And I can tell you this, as capital allocators, we have certainly shifted to more defensive investments. Even when we do growth projects, we're picking the markets and the operators that are in the uh, non-cyclical markets. For example, Midwest. I just came back literally from a potential upcoming project in uh, suburbs of Detroit for multifamily assets. And I love the assets. They're in great real estate locations, great value as strategy, just non-renovated units for 15 years. They all look classic. And the downside protection is very strong from the point of view that the rents are low. And then the market is non-cyclical. When you have that kind of correction, you see it in Southern California. You're going to see it in Phoenix. You're going to see it in Austin, Las Vegas, probably Southern Florida. The Midwest markets are a lot more defensive. So in this environment, you can invest for growth. You can invest for income. Just picking and choosing investments with good downside protection is the way to go, kind of on a very high level, sort of what we do today. And the easy way to find us, bigmikefund.com is a website. So, or templefunding.com, our corporate website. And you'll find that information also in our show notes. Mike, tell us, what is the best way to stay ahead of this curve as we look into the future here? Some people are saying, oh, no, we haven't reached the peak. It's going to go up. I don't believe that. I, I think we're heading for a recession and uh, stagnation, as you were saying. So how do we stay ahead of this curve? So it's a great question, Ellen. And I try not to predict things. Predicting is very difficult. <laughs> I try to think like Warren Buffett. I love the way Warren and Charlie run their business. And that's the best way to think about it today, looking for value investments rather than looking for predictions of what the Fed is going to do. So there's a pretty good probability with what Fed is going to do based on the communication mechanism, but it doesn't even matter. What matters is to find investments that have a great intrinsic value relative to the price you're paying. So that's kind of the holy grail of the investment. Look for value investments rather than look for growth. There are times when growth investments do really well, but stagflation 101, investing in growth stocks or growth projects and bonds is the worst thing you can do. Just taking a, taking a general high-level look, what to avoid is uh, growth investments and bonds because as interest rates rise, bonds lose value. So what's good generally during stagflation, and again, this is my opinion, but it, it's something that I think is, will stand the test of time, uh, value investments, val value stocks if you're a stock market investor, and in general, value investments. Energy generally does pretty well. We're seeing this, the energy prices are pretty healthy, especially oil and gas, and then obviously other commodities do well. So commodities, and then real estate. Real estate is a great hedge against inflation. Can't state this enough. And again, there's real estate and there's real estate. So picking defensive real estate investments with good downside protection, good location, good bones, and a very predictable value of strategy is a way to sort of protect yourself against what might happen. And if things go up or they go down, it almost doesn't matter. As long as you pick and choose your investments with that philosophy in mind, if things don't go well, you'll be downside protected. If things go great, well, you'll pick up the tide that raises all boats. Mike, what is the secret to locating 
and investing in the best real estate funds? So it's a great question. And I can tell you as a fund manager how we operate. And the exercise of an investor to find the right one-off deals or to find the right funds comes down to finding these right operators. In real estate, unless you're running a very big REIT, you're running typically a small private fund or, or some kind of a private fund. And it's network. There's really no better way to put it. How do we find most of our deals? We find it through our network. We've been in this business for many years, so we've developed these strong relationships with the right operators. But it took us years to understand the difference between somebody who is a good promoter versus a good operator. We are looking for the operators, and we can bring them the capital they need. We want the people who are not good at raising capital, but they're great at what they do with the operation. And these people, you can't find them by Googling them or searching. They just don't know how to market because they don't market. That's not what they do. So it comes down to network connections. So if you can network with the folks in the right, I belong to multiple very strong masterminds and I'm very well connected. This is one of the things that I do. One of my biggest strengths is networking with the top operators around the country. And as we do this, we learn very quickly as we invest with someone one operator versus another, we see how they do business, how they manage everything, how they deal with problems, and we'll learn who is a better one and who is a worse one. And the test of time, the bad part about real estate investing, it's slow. These projects are not done overnight. So you have to spend years sometimes watching, observing, learning who's good and who's not. So your best way to invest is not with the new fund managers who have learned this from a new webinar or some trade show, but more of folks who have been around, who have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and have learned quite a bit. And they have strong networks and connections that can, can bring these, these operators and the deals to the table versus the brilliant marketers who are just really good at getting in front of your eyes with bright and shiny objects and promising great returns. Mike, there certainly are a lot of those operators out there and uh, wise advice to stay away from that kind of thing. Mike, tell us real quickly here as we close out the show, what are the top 10 questions that we should ask before investing in any fund? Sure. So there are many questions and hard to say top 10. I did write a book a while back, top 10 questions. I'm going to go through a, a few of them, but there are many questions. So the real basic question, right? Before you invest, this is fun an income fund or a growth fund? What's the fund investment strategy? What is going to invest in? Right? The real, real basic questions. Also, what has the fund been around and what's in the fund? So this is one of the questions that folks forget to ask. When they approach a new fund, a brand new fund, there's nothing in the fund. Right? You can ask the question, but you're not going to get an answer. But if you approach an existing fund, ask them for the portfolio. What's in the fund? How these assets are doing? This is a very helpful question. A ton of people will go read the uh, prospectus, and it'll say this pref, this split, this target return. But you can ask the question to the fund manager, what's in the fund? How the assets are doing? Can you give me a little bit more information? That helps a lot. It really helps. This is the secret sauce question, really powerful question. When you're investing in a close-ended fund, when did the fund start raising capital? And when is it going to close raising capital? And what's in the portfolio? So when you're investing in a close-ended fund, you have massive benefit by coming in if you enter the fund towards the end of capital raising, because you have pretty good visibility of what's in the fund. Not only that, you can, if you, the investments are great, you can yield strip. The funny term means if the fund has pays eight pref, but the assets are projected to generate higher return, you may benefit by coming in late. Your effective yield could be higher than the people who come in early. And different funds have different mechanisms to equalize that, but that's an important question. The other question you should ask as a, an investor, what are the fees? What are you paying? Typically, does the fund have management fees? What are they? Asset acquisition fees? Promote? What are you paying fund managers? And typically, the fees go in conjunction with what are the preferred returns? What's a pref? And what are the splits? So there are plenty of funds, what they call them institutional waterfall, where you as an investor get a pref and then a split of, say, 80-20 or 70-30 versus some funds offer eight pref and then 50-50. Right? I mean, you have to understand what are these terms mean, but why they're important because they generate the right risk-adjusted return. Other questions you can ask, does the fund distribute quarterly or it doesn't? Or, or how frequent are the distributions? 
And then it's, it's very important to understand if you have an open-ended fund distributes quarterly or monthly, that's one thing versus a closed-ended fund that may distribute or, or not quarterly. Understanding the fund strategy and the fund doesn't distribute initially, one of the questions to ask, when do you think the distributions will start? So if you're investing in the income strategy, distributions may start immediately. But if you're investing in a growth strategy, distributions may be delayed by a couple of years until the value at work is completed on these projects. The other questions you can ask about tax efficiency, which is a very important question, obviously. How is the income generated and how is the income taxed? And does the fund have special tax benefits? So I'll give you an example, a little bit selfishly, because we set up a fund this way. We believe this is a phenomenal setup. But our Tempo Growth Fund 2 has two classes of units, one called Preferred Equity Class, or Class A units, and we also have Class B units, which are common equity units. And the way we set it up is Preferred Equity units are safer, and they work really well for IRA investors because they're safer and they don't need any depreciation benefits. While the Class B units take on more risk, they have high return potential, but they also take all the losses. So they have great tax efficiency. And so understanding that is very, very important. If you are an investor who needs losses, for example, you have gains from sale of real estate, you have an appreciated asset, you sold it. Instead of 1031, you want to roll the money into something that gives you a ton of tax benefits to offset those gains. That technique actually works. It's called pigs versus pulse. Passive investment gains versus passive allocation losses. If they happen in the same year, they offset each other. So things like that are very, very helpful if a fund has great tax efficiency. So there are many other questions, but I'm going to shut up for a minute, <laughs> let you, because I, I could talk of this for probably an hour. There are all kinds of great questions you can ask. We do this all the time when we invest in the deals. We will scrutinize the deals, we'll ask the operator, but you'll questions. How do you deal with this situation? How do you deal with that situation? Have you had any losses? What the portfolio is composed of? How many assets are performing relative to how many are underperforming and why? So you could go as deep as you like, depending on how comfortable you are. If you're an engineering type, if your mind works like an engineer, you can ask a ton of questions. And if you are more of a relationship driven, and you're just happy to get to know, like, and trust. By the way, that's the first question of all questions. How do you get to know, like, and trust that fund manager so you can invest with them? And that's a whole grail question. It's very hard to do, and it takes years sometimes to develop unless there's a strong referral chain. So if you try to bring a new deal to me, and I'm going to ask you who referred you, and if I don't have a good referral chain, I'm not going to even waste the time. But if it is a good referral chain, most of the deals we fund, they come as a referral. I'll give you an example. So I know other fund managers, and we don't have much in, let's just say, a light industrial space. We, we just haven't invested in that space. So I asked another fund manager, do you know anybody who does industrial light industrial? And they gave me a referral. They had a conversation. At least you're bridging the time it takes to at least have a conversation with somebody they know really well. That's how the world gets around. That's how you get to actually decent operators through the chain of referrals. Enlightened investors, it is always a joy and a pleasure to be with you as we pick the brains of very knowledgeable and experienced real estate investors such as Mike. I know it's been a pleasure for me and I know it has been for you as well. Mike, thank you so much. It's been wonderful and extraordinarily enlightening. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Alan. Thank you kindly. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steed Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steed Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steed Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at steedtalker.com.